we are grateful to have you with us as we are recording for uh, ultimately putting it out to YouTube and Facebook, of course, and we appreciate anyone who would share this and help others to be able to know about our Bible experience together we're having here on Wednesday night. We invite others, of course, to join us for our community meal at 6.30 and then our teaching uh, somewhere around 7 to 7.30. We get started and sing some songs and and get into the Bible together. Of course, tonight we want to sing for a few moments and consecrate our hearts. This midweek service is important and a blessing to us. We're going to sing, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Excuse me, I'm on the wrong one. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> the capo is good, but it can be bad. <laughs> The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The fifth chapter is where we are teaching from. We are blessed to have you, and of course, we're blessed to have those who are joining us. We appreciate those who are able to tune in from time to time, and some are able to tune in practically every Wednesday night or the, the day following, whatever time we post it. And, uh, we're glad for that. We appreciate your encouragement. Several of them have been commenting and letting us know they're following along with us. Some of my cousins and different ones and family members, of course, and uh, uh, friends across the area. And we're grateful for that. Uh, we are looking at Galatians chapter 5. And, of course, every one of these epistles, every chapter is just packed with so many wonderful things for us to unpack and to, and to feed on and to meditate on. I tell you, I don't know what... Uh, people do if they're not able to have time to be able to spend with scriptures and, and to be able to meditate on the great things God has done for us. We spend a lot of our time teaching and talking about who we are 
in Christ Jesus, of course, and we spend a lot of time encouraging people to appropriate the things that God has given us in Christ. Uh, we try to get people to discover in the scriptures for themselves, of course. The Bible says God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. And so it's only natural then to want to search out what are those spiritual blessings. And of course, we began teaching last week more so, and sort of been talking a good bit about being led of the Spirit and following the inward witness, and that kind of brought us to this teaching of the pursuit of Christian character. And we read Galatians 5, 7, and you can look at that again if you would, and the Word of God says, Ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And we have been saying, of course, that uh, when you think of the pursuit of Christian characters as if you're running a race, and somebody said it sure does seem to be a marathon, it's probably not a sprint. <laughs> and it does seem to be, you know, it's a lifelong thing of learning and developing uh, spiritually. But I'll tell you, time spent in the Bible and in the things of God is not wasted time. I've never seen anybody say that they regretted time spent in church and in the Bible. If the Lord was being honored in what they were doing, they were always glad they spent that time. Amen. And for those who've come down the last mile of the way, as I've spent time in hospital rooms and hospice centers and in people's homes as people were nearing the time when they would be going on to be with the Lord, they were glad that they had put spiritual things first in their lives. They were so uh, so much rejoicing, even at death, they were so glad that they knew where they were going and that they had developed a, a heart and a spirit that was conformable to the things of Christ and that they had an appetite for the good things of God. I tell you, we're never going to be sorry, brethren, uh, for time spent around the altar of God, time spent in the house of the Lord with God's family and with the teaching of God's Word. I tell you, it's so rich and wonderful. Uh, it's my whole life. I don't know how you could enjoy life otherwise without first knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and what God has done for you and then also what our responsibilities are now that we're saved. Once you get born again, it's as if you are running a race. Paul the Apostle used the race metaphor several times, the idea of a runner and all that. Paul the Apostle used that. He used the things having to do with soldiers, uh, but certainly he used some of those athletic metaphors several different times. And uh, he even said about his own life, he said, I'm getting ready here to finish my course. Isn't that right? He said, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. I'm running this race to its end. Amen. Well, one of the pursuits that we have as believers is, as we're seeking to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, we call it Christ-likeness or Christ-conformity. Last week, we made reference to Philippians chapter 3, where Paul the Apostle said that he did not act like somebody that had already attained. He didn't see himself as somebody that was already perfect. The word perfect there, of course, means mature or complete. Uh, he said, you know, I'm still reaching out. I'm still pursuing uh, the things of God to become fully mature and complete, you know, in Christ Jesus in every way. If Paul the Apostle had looked at other people and compared himself with others, he might have been tempted to sort of sit back on his laurel somewhat. He might even have got proud because it looks like everything we see from Scripture that Paul the Apostle was probably the most outstanding Christian uh, that this world has ever had. Uh, you know, it may be that uh, that would be arguable in some cases. And people say, well, I think others were, you know, somewhat similar. And that might be true. But when you think of the Apostle Paul, he certainly was a mature and, and marvelous man of God, mightily used of God, of course, but also a humble brother still yet with all that God had blessed him with. And he says, I'm still reaching. I'm still running this race. I, there's a prize before me. He said, I got all the motivation in the world to keep reaching out for what it is. Uh, that I have in Christ Jesus and what I would like to have. And so he says, I don't act like I've already attained all these things. He said, I'm still reaching. Amen. And that's good for us. The Bible teaches that Paul also said, those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. So if I compare myself to you and get my eyes on you or you do the same with me, that's really not wise when it comes to a spiritual life. I mean, no, this is a race you're running pretty much. If there's any competition at all, you're really kind of competing with yourself, not someone else. Isn't that right? You're really watching after yourself and running this race and endeavoring to be like Jesus. Jesus is the goal. Uh, if you're going to make a comparison, you ought to compare yourself to him and not somebody else. Yeah. Isn't that true? I mean, anytime you compare yourself to him, you realize, kind of like Paul did, I need to keep reaching. I need to keep on. 
Somehow or another, you know, when people reach a certain point in their Christian life, if they're not careful, they think, well, I know the Bible, and I've been to Sunday school a lot, and I've been to teaching and preaching and revival, so I kind of got this. I'm just going to push it up neutral. I'll get me a promise out of the promise box every once in a while, and I'll go to church and see if, uh, if the pastor will do my witnessing for me, and i got the Holy Ghost doing my praying for me, so therefore... I could just, uh, you know, push it up in neutral and let God drag me the rest of the way. <laughs> but I mean, no, that's a real lie of the enemy. It's a real deception of the enemy. And as I said to you last week, if you're not careful, you'll get on a detour somewhere. A lot of times when people wind up on a detour spiritually, it's because they've kind of stopped reaching out and they're not reaching out for spiritual growth. They're kind of satisfied where they are. I said to you last week, the desire, somebody said, is divine dissatisfaction. Well, there's a certain dissatisfaction going on the inside of you that makes you want to keep reaching and growing in the things of the Lord. And we want to cultivate that as much as we can. Philip Brooks said that the great purpose of life, the shaping of character by truth. Character is defined, you know, just in a regular dictionary as the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. Whatever a person's moral and mental, uh, you know, whatever their... Uh, characteristics is along that line we look at that as their overall character but you know the root word in the old word that from which character came from had to do with the word inscribe or engrave you know whenever you engrave something on a piece of metal or like you have some trophy or something like that you give to somebody and there's an engraving in there you know it takes a little time that's a that's a that's a work you know that won't be easily removed either when you engrave something you make a mark in there, it's a pretty permanent <laughs> mark. You know, you'd have to really come up with some way to, to remove that mark. And as you go along, you don't realize it sometimes, but the things around you are inscribing things onto, your, onto who you are. You're becoming, your character is conforming, and you're being engraved upon by the things around you, by whatever it is you're accepting into your life. And that's why there has to be a lot of wisdom about what we accept into our lives and also the things we reject from our lives. Isn't that true? Uh, that engraving is happening all the time. That uh, inscribing is taking place all the time. And so we want to encourage people uh, to be running this race, to be reaching out. The Galatians, many of them were new converts. Paul the Apostle, we believe this is one of the first uh, places he went on the very first missionary trip and so this is probably one of the earliest letters he wrote might have been the very first one and it, what happened there of course is what happens all over the world when I've done missionary work if you go somewhere and you get a group of people saved then everybody else when they find out that you've got spiritual interest and you were willing to come up in a service and confess Christ then every other cult everybody else in the world comes knocking on your door because they know while you're just a baby Christian that you might be swayed one way or another to be able to join up with their group. And so that's what will happen, you know, and that's kind of what happened to the Galatians, that people came along and started telling them things that was actually hindering them in their Christian life. I tell you, I want to be helpers of people's joy. I want to help people in their spiritual life. I've been to help people that bless me, older Christians, took me under their wing and they talked to me and talked to me and they talked to me about character, they talked to me about things like that wonderful uh, pastors and ministers out of the past, wonderful Christian friends in other countries and here at home. They, they ministered to me. They spoke into my life, and it changed my life. It helped me. That was that engraving that was taking place, you know, where I realized as they were t telling me things that it was wisdom right out of the Bible. And so I've been marvelously helped. I tell you, I want to help other people. I don't want to hinder anybody. Amen. These Galatian people were not Jewish to begin with, and so for people to come over there and say, look here, if you really want to be spiritual, you've got to start doing the things that the Jews do. They even said, you know, look here, Paul, he's a Jew, and he was circumcised. So Paul writes them the letter and said, look here, circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't avail anything but a new creature in Christ Jesus. Paul brought their attention back to the fact that they'd been born again. Amen. Instead of allowing that to become a stumbling block in their lives, so Paul showed them, of course, the role of the law and all that, and he showed them that instead of trying to be Jewish, that really they need to be following Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, some of the people believed back then, you know, of course, even some of those who claimed to be saved, they said, you know, if you really want to be a Christian, you've got to become a Jew to become a Christian. And that was what the first big church council was about in Acts 15, and the apostles had to decide 
that when they sent out a letter to the Gentiles that they told them, you don't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. You have to become a Christian to be a Christian. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, it was freedom. They just said, look here, uh, to abstain from fornication, abstain from things that have been strangled. In other words, don't follow the pagan way of doing things where they were are cooking animals in their blood and eating the blood and all that kind of thing. He said, stay away from that. Keep yourself away from idols. You know, all the basic things that have to do with sanctification and all that. But he said, we're not going to lay upon them any other burden. He said, whenever you deal with people like they were dealing with some of the Galatians, we call them Judaizers because they claim to be Christians, but yet they wanted to hold on to some of the Jewish law in a way that was a uh, hindrance to people in their Christian life. So Paul the Apostle said, you did run well. You were doing well. What happened? What caused you to detour? Who, who you know, uh, come along and cast a spell on you? What kind of witch, witchcraft worker did you get around that cast some kind of spell on you and is hindering your Christian life? And I tell you, false teaching, wrong teachings, teachings that are not based on the Bible are going to hinder you in your spiritual life. Sensational teaching that is not based on the scripture. Right now, a lot of people are looking for something sensational. And in many ways, people won't accept a teaching like I'm giving you here because it looks like to them it takes too long. You know, it takes a while to develop character. It's a lifetime, of course. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, when people don't have everything they need, see, so much Christian ministry is based on an emergency. You know, come and get your felt needs met right now. Whatever you're feeling, if you're sick, whatever else. And, of course, we know that the Lord blesses so many times, helps people in so many ways about their needs. But, you know, as you grow in the Lord, you know, it shouldn't be that you're having one emergency after another, so to speak. Well, anybody can have that. Uh, but we understand that, you know, there should be some growth and people begin to develop. Every church service can't just be about the emergency need. Isn't that right? We've also got to do some discipleship, help people begin to grow up in the Lord, and become conscious of who they are, what their responsibilities are. They've got to find out, of course, that to be able to have great character, that there's a Godward side of that. God has caused us to be born again. He's given us the spirit to, to empower us to be able to bear fruit. But also, there's a side of it that belongs to us. We have a responsibility in it. That's never as a popular teaching. Anytime you start get up teaching, start telling people they've got a responsibility in it, then I may know that's not as popular. And if you're not up here pulling a rabbit out of a hat, you know, and if you're not teaching people, you know, and proclaiming, you know, some very sensational things of what all God's doing, I tell you what, you can just go down the line and flip on the, the YouTube preachers one, one after another, just as soon as they start preaching. God's getting ready to do this. And God's getting ready to do that. I'm here to tell you, God's been ready longer than we have. <laughs> the problem is not whether or not God is ready. The problem is whether or not we're going to get prepared to seek Him, to follow Him, and to do those things He would have us to do. Isn't that right? But every single service about it is God's getting ready. They've got some little cute little angle, some cute little sermon title, and they're working at for all they get. They're pumping at, pumping at, pumping at. But I'm here to tell you, uh, we need something deeper than that. We need something more wonderful than that. Can God use somebody like that sometimes? Certainly. As an evangelist and what have you, when I preach, uh, certainly in Jamaica and different places, sometimes it's the only night you're going to be there, maybe. Uh, I really liked it a lot better when I could be there a lot of nights and so we could build on something and all that. But as an evangelist, you throw it out there. God's going to save. God's going to heal and deliver. And we believe he will. And he ought so often, so many times does. But I mean, no, that is not uh, the entire teaching that we have to offer as the church. We can help people come along spiritually and begin to see their lives conform to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, not to always just be, you know, calling out for uh, somebody to meet an emergency need. Think of this scripture here, Ephesians 5, 1. The Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. It literally gives us this idea to be followers, or the word there really indicates imitate. Be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. That is a lot to, uh, to give out in just one sentence. Uh, to walk in love as Christ, you know, you think to yourself, you know, it's, why would he tell us that? Is there any possibility that could ever happen? <laughs> you know, for one thing, it seems far out uh, to walk like Christ walked and all that or to be, follow, be imitators of God. 
But this is the teaching of the New Testament for believers that their lives can begin to take on the nature and the character of the Lord Jesus Christ and really have from the moment they were born again. Now, of course, they'll have to live in the light of that. And, of course, we want to help people. It ought to be our great pursuit. That's why we're calling it the pursuit of Christian character. Once you get born again, headed toward heaven, what do you do? Do you just push it up neutral and wait until the rapture comes and the trumpet blows? How do you occupy it until it comes? What is it that we're in pursuit of? It is Christ's conformity, conforming to Christ. The Bible says we need to be conformed to the image of his dear son. You shouldn't be conformed to the world, but be conformed in the same book of the Bible, the book of Romans, it says, conform to the image of his son. That means, of course, uh, to walk as he walked. It gave it right here to us. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Galatians 5 says, the fruit of the spirit is love. Then after that, joy, peace, I'm suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those, are, those words all describe Christian character. This is what Christian character will look like whenever it is brought forth in the life of the believer. These nine words, some people say, really, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and then all the other eight, those other eight words are all the things that come out of the fruit of the love of God in a person's life. The Bible says that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Well, I found that it's a bigger challenge than I first thought it would be when it comes to walking according to that love that's been shed abroad in my heart. Somebody said, I'll tell you what we need. We just need a love revival. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible said the love of God's already been shed abroad in my heart. The Bible teaches I've already been born of the very love of God. I already have it. So what I must do is learn how to live by the inward man, this new man that is on the inside of me. I've got to learn how to live in accordance with being a new man. The Bible actually says a couple of times, you know, put on a new man. <laughs> in other words, Live like it's true. <laughs> Act like it's true. Act like you're a new person because you are. Live like it's so. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul the Apostle said to the church at Corinth, he said, you know, make love. He said, you know, choose charity. First Corinthians 14, of course, the Bible says that they should reach out uh, in the love of God. We'll read that to you so that you'll get both the King James and sort of the rendering. He says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. Uh, whenever you read that from, uh, get some help, you know, from the Greek, it actually indicates make love your great aim and your great quest in life. What is a great quest? That'd be like a, a journey or like a mission that you're on, the great quest. So the great pursuit of life is Christian character and the love of God. A lot of times you start talking about the love of God, it's like folks tune you out and say, man, I have, I have heard all of that before. But this is the ticket to everything else. This is the way to get to all the other things that Christian character represents. How are you going to have joy, peace, and long-suffering gentleness unless you first have the love of God? Now, the love of God is what helps you settle things between you uh, and God, first of all, and then you and everybody else. I mean, if you get things right vertically, you ought to have things right horizontally. Amen. Now, this means between me and you, between you and the rest of the world, you can have peace and the love of God toward other people even if they don't have it toward you. It's challenging. I didn't think it'd be challenging to have it with other believers. When I first got into this, you know, I thought, you went to church, I thought they all kind of had angel's wings, but I found out that was just shoulder blades sticking out the back. <laughs> and, you know, and I thought, this is going to be easy. This is going to be fine, you know. And, uh, you know, somebody said, you know, living with folks up above, that's not so bad. You know, if you're in heaven already, but down here below is where the trouble is. <laughs> Isn't that right? Amen. You see, folks a lot of time won't bear this kind of teaching. They won't endure sound doctrine along this line because, for one thing, it's not sensational. And also, of course, uh, it doesn't promise an overnight success. It's likely you're going to miss it, make mistakes. Sometimes you're going to have to ask for forgiveness. Sometimes you're going to be willing to forgive. Hello? <laughs> and that's not, you know, it's kind of like it is having a home and a family. It's just not something that is developed overnight. And there's going to be some dysfunction in every home, every family, every person. There's going to be a little bit of dysfunction at least. Even the holiest child of God is going to have things in his life that is going to have to have some growth and development, what have you, in whatever home that you can think of. 
uh, it's going to come down whether or not people have the courage to face their own attitudes and courage to face their own character. And if they'll face it, they can grow and the family will appreciate that and they'll gain respect from the family. If not, uh, the barrier begins to get thicker and higher between them and the communication gap becomes more profound as they go along. But if a daddy will say you know, to the family, forgive me, I've missed it, and he'll make some adjustments or whatever, that can endear his family to him, they can grow together and learn from it, same way with every other member of the family. But fathers are to lead the homes, they can set a tone, they can say, look here, I've missed it, made some mistakes. Uh, at a time of weakness or whatever, said, th said something I shouldn't have said. How many know that's what the love of God will do? You know, if you really want to look for a spiritual person, if somebody said, well, if we're going to look for somebody spiritual, where, where will we look? Will we look at church? Will we look out here in, you know, at, in the workplace or at school? But how many brethren, uh, where we look, first of all, is right there in the home. Yes. Did you know a lot of folks can gain ground in the home if they just go back to treat one another at least as good as they treat new people that they've never met? They go out here to Walmart sometimes. They'll treat somebody they meet up down the aisle, treat them better than they do people in their own home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and see, once something, once a pattern gets into the home, people start, you know, it's kind of like a broken record. You can hear that old scratch of that needle <laughs> come around every so you know. Here it is. And people get into a groove and they can't break out of it, it seems like. But it's a deception of the enemy. I mean, we can break out of it. It means we have to humble ourselves sometimes and admit that maybe we have some dysfunction there. Somehow or another we got the wrong idea. Sometimes people are just angry and that anger is just laying right under the surface. So the first time something happens around the home, then they speak out in such a way, you know, that's ugly. Hello? <laughs> it's easier to do than what we realize, isn't it? It's just simmering right there under the surface. That's why some folks have a rough time with profane language because actually they're mad, they're angry. And uh, the love of God, you know, they're not in, in control uh, the Holy Spirit's not in control of their life. The fruit of the Spirit, these things we're talking about, Christ-likeness, a lot of these things are just different ways to say the same thing. Christ-likeness, the fruit of the Spirit, Christian character, under the control of the Holy Spirit. These are the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is what gives us the ability to bear this fruit. You couldn't bear this fruit on your own. You'd have to be born again, and then you'll have to cultivate it. You see, you're running this race. He's writing these Galatian people. He says to them, notice Galatians 5 down here, uh, just about uh, along the lines of verse 19 and 20. He gives them the works of the flesh, things that they, anybody should be able to easily identify. Verse 18, if you led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. It's open. We can see it right out here. This is what the flesh will do. And it says... Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatreds, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. He said this is not the whole list, but this is a, this is a good way to be able to know what the rest of the list is going to look like. <laughs> and such like, and such like. Not only that, he says, of the which I tell you before, evidently he told them personally, I guess, before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. That ought to scare the liver out of you. Yeah. That if you're involved in these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right. Now you can rewrite your Bible all you want to, but when you come to that verse right there, you're going to have a rough time rewriting that. Amen. Might ought to just reread it. <laughs> and realize it's for our good that God is looking out for our eternity. Amen. So if we live by the flesh, we can't please God. If we live by the flesh, we're going to reap corruption. If we live according to the flesh, uh, then we're going to miss heaven. The flesh will take people into eternity, an eternity of hell, Amen. separation from God. You see, we live in a physical body that's not yet been fully redeemed. As Christians, we've been redeemed spiritually, certainly, and we live in a body now that is dedicated to God's service and sanctified, set apart for that purpose. But if a person goes back to allowing the flesh to dominate them, I mean, the flesh is going to lead them in a direction that is the opposite of the Spirit of God. We just we saw it there in verse 17 last week, but it says, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. These two things are going to go against each other. So at some point you've got to decide who you're going to let control. <laughs> Isn't that true? 
And of course, uh, if you build yourself up spiritually, develop this Christian character we're talking about, I mean, then you don't have to live according to the flesh. Amen. Our physical body, you know, uh, certainly is, uh, is dedicated to God now as Christians, but you know, if a person gets away from God, doesn't fellowship with the Lord, doesn't cultivate their spiritual life, they'll begin to do some of the things that they used to do before they got saved. Because they're being dominated by their physical body. Paul the Apostle said to the church at Corinth uh, that you're following your ordinary impulses. We expect these things out of the world. That's just the ordinary way. Murders, fornication, the sensual sins and social sins. Envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings. We expect that out of people that are not redeemed and are living entirely just according to the desires of their unredeemed body. Thank God there's coming a day when the Bible says even our physical bodies will be fully redeemed. There will be a manifestation of the sons of God. The word of God says all the creation is groaning for the day that comes when we will receive the redemption of our body. And I tell you, for all of us that get some age on us, the redemption of our body is looking sweeter every day. <laughs> but right now, brethren, of course, we live in a house of flesh that is doomed to die. That if the rapture didn't take us out of here, then we have a physical body that's wearing out. We have a physical body that in and of itself cannot please God. There is a conflict between the appetites of the flesh and the desire of the Holy Spirit within us. The victory is, of course, in that we develop this Christian character. Once we're born again, we have the word with all to be, to be able to become Christ-like. We have the commandment from God that we should be Christ-like. And if God is a just God, he would never tell you to be Christ-like unless he's going to give you the ability to do so. Only a just God would call on you to, to follow Jesus and then give you the power to actually do so. Amen. Amen. Thank God, brethren, we have it tonight. And of course, it is uh, culminated in the crucifixion. The Bible teaches that you and I are crucified with Christ. The book of Romans uses the word reckon he says, you know, when it comes to these things, you've got to reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. In other words, you've got to get in agreement with God. If God says when you got born again that you died to sin, then you've got to reckon it that way. You've got to say, yep, that's what happened. Not only did Christ die for me, but I died uh, to sin. And as a result of it, thank God, through the crucifixion, the work that he's done, now I'm alive in Christ. As, you know, Paul the Apostle said it this way in the same book of Galatians, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I still got a flesh, I still got a body I live in. It's my earth suit. If I lose my earth suit, I got to move out. <laughs> and the Bible says if you're Physical body is dissolved. You got a home in the heavens, but you can't be in both places at the same time. You're either going to be up there or be down here. When you lose the earth suit, uh, then you're going to have to change addresses or start getting your mail at a different place. <laughs> Isn't that right? Amen. But thank God while we're here, we have this earth suit, but he said, the life I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God. The law cannot produce in me the fruit of the Spirit. The law cannot do the things in me that would cause me to be Christ-like. I've got to have the life of God. I've got the resurrection life of the Son of God at work within my life. That gives me such hopefulness about conforming to Christ. It's not all going to happen overnight. And some people will never appreciate it too much because, you, you know, the preacher can't get up there and promise them that they'll be full-grown spiritually and have all of this by the end of the week. Kind of like one fellow, you know, that... Uh, I was talking to, he's talking about giving his call to the ministry. He'd been saved for about a month. And I said, well, if you would just take time and, and be discipled and get built up. If you have the call of God, that's wonderful. We'll help you with that and all that. But I said, you know, give it some time here for you to get developed. He said, I've been in it almost a month. <laughs> and you see, that goes right against our culture. That goes against human nature. Everybody wants it all done right now. i got to have it. You know, you got to give it to me. And if they don't get it from the Lord just as soon as they say, then they're, they're done with it. And they think, well, maybe somehow or another God doesn't, uh, God doesn't really have it for me. But that's where, you know, there's a patience. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is patience, where you allow patience to have its perfect work. 
until it makes you perfect and entire wanting nothing. Now you have to get in this thing for the long haul and begin to realize you're going to learn and develop. There's times you're going to embarrass yourself. It's a humbling thing. I mean, if you start making yourself correct yourself all along the way, you'll quit making as many mistakes. <laughs> Isn't that right? Thank God, brethren, there's hope tonight because our Lord has come into this world. He didn't come in this world just to, you know, give us some type of religious experience and turn over a new leaf and try to intend to be better. Man, he brought transforming power into our lives. We're not just religious adherents. We are resurrected sons of God. We've been made alive under God. We may not be living this life, but it's not because we're short on supply when it comes to what we need to live this Christian life. Amen. Well, brethren, let's pray for those that are watching tonight. I feel like we should pray. Our Father God, we just pray for those that are joining us. And Father, we pray for one another as Christians, God. Help us, God, to be filled with the knowledge of your will and our wisdom and spiritual understanding. Help us to grow in grace and knowledge. Lord, this world needs to see Jesus through the church and in our lives. And Father, help me to grow, Father God. Help us to humble ourselves and know that we're not home yet and that we need every grace at work in our lives. Help us, Father God, to be able to show forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us, God, for those times we come short. And help us to know, Father God, there's more for us than there is against us. And there's more help than there is harm in this world because of the Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for it now, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us.